boom what's up everyone welcome to simulation i'm your host alan sakyan really excited to be talking about psychometric ai today we have dr avi tushman joining us on the show hello hi alan thanks for coming on thanks so much for having me really appreciate it super excited we have a lot to unpack here in conversation for those that don't know avi's background avi's the founder and ceo of pinpoint predictive He's an internationally recognized expert on heritable psychometric traits, and we are super pumped to dive into this. All right, so let's start with how you got interested in psychometric AI. Yeah, wow, so would you like the short version or the little bit medium version? Give us the, give us the longer the, the version. Medium? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so I was always a very adventurous person, and um, Academically, I started off in the field of anthropology, um, and I, I did my undergraduate work um, in uh, Quechua humor. So that's a that's a Native American language spoken in South America. Um, just uh, an adventurous person, and then you know one day I, I had to get a first job, and I wound up working also in South America, but um, working in the field of shaping public opinion, um, working in some very complex political environments post, post-conflict, um, working with corporations and with, with government, and uh, coming into a very polarized society that had just gone through um, a lot of internal warfare and, and terrorism, and um, I, I saw a lot of extremism, and I, I hadn't been exposed to that before, whether it was uh, on the far left or the far right. It was before our country became uh, a little bit more polarized, all right? And uh, started getting really interested in the, in the question of why did people have such distorted ways of looking at the world? So sort of got into, I guess, what you might call moral psychology, um, and then went back to graduate school at Stanford to try to understand this, um, but I was doing evolutionary biology and anthropology, and um, the traditional answers weren't really considered adequate. Um, from, from the point of view of that field. So I started digging deeper, you know, getting into fields like genetics or what uh, behavioral biology, um, neuroscience, um, you know, did, and, and I, I, the one thing that I did get some considerable training in, because um, these are very diverse areas, was um, evolutionary theory. And beyond just uh, telling stories, but like, you know, how do you um, evaluate fitness quantitatively? Um, so anyway, long story short, I wound, I wound up um, publishing a book that was about heritable psychometric traits, kind of tying together all these really interesting studies to understand at a deeper level um, why moral psychology exists, why people have different values, why they are similar across countries, um, what the logic is, and um, so I guess you could say I was driven by a desire to find the best data known to science to understand people, to make predictions, in particular to make forward-facing predictions at the individual level. So when you spend years reading through, you know, probably, probably hundreds, I'd have to count, but probably hundreds of uh, peer-reviewed articles in um, marketing journals and, and political science and, and, and the harder sciences, um, psychometrics comes up as very, very valuable kind of data. You kind of think of it back then as like that rare earth element of data. Um, it, 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 it was hard to get, um, but this was the best data. It had the most predictive power. Um, so I wound up publishing this book and getting some considerable expertise until I reached kind of a, a pivotal, pivotal point. Um, kind of a crossroads in my career yeah so that's the first half okay and even as you move into the second half there's something super interesting i want to point out this this it's so important for us to put our minds around the complexity of what it's like for billions of humans to figure out how to work together mm -hmm. um through all of the different languages through all of the different belief systems that we have through all the different ways that we macroeconomically and geopolitically work together mm -hmm. it's very complex you know your time when you were 
when you were figuring out public opinion mm -hmm. and the way that people's minds evolve and form mm -hmm. is very fascinating stuff. And then when you went further into understanding the psychometric side of things, this like rare, rare uh, ability, this rare metal that we have, precious mm -hmm. mineral, let's say, mm -hmm. of, 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 of human uh, psyche is so interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. I, I certainly find an interesting area, um, endlessly interesting, but that's that's me. Maybe maybe uh, just my, my mentors, but I, I, I agree with you. So, all right. So I came to this crossroads in my career. I published this uh, a book uh, about heritable psychometric traits, and it um, got to share it with a lot of different parts of the world. It, it got covered in about twenty four countries. There's a, a Chinese language version coming out uh, pretty soon, and you know a, a, a paperback here in the U.S. Um, but I realized that there were these big economic changes happening all around, and that I was part of those, right? Uh, when I was young, I didn't think so much about economic forces. I was interested in these, these kind of questions. Um, but maybe it's just that you know, I graduated in 2002 after the tech bubble burst uh, from undergrad, and then I, I finished my, my doctoral research in 2008. Um, so I was very strongly affected by these economic forces. And I'd also spent a lot of time in um, kind of advising and in, in businesses uh, in writing as well. So those are content creation. And uh, my father is a professional photographer, uh, incredibly talented, and um, thank goodness had a, had a really great career. But toward the tail end, I could also see um, kind of the, and feel the devaluation of content creation. And I'd read this book by Jerome Lanier um, that was brilliant. And it's called Who Owns the Future? And it's a book that I really liked a lot because I felt that he had brilliant ideas on many of the pages. Um, don't, there are some parts that uh, you know, I agree with more than others. But o overall, like 95%, I think, um, brilliant. He just cuts through all the ideology. and talks about these economic, uh, these, these changes in technology from an economic point of view, and what does it really mean? And that was inspiring to me, because basically what he says, and I, I would encourage everyone to read that book, because I can't possibly do it justice by summarizing it. It's, it's hard to do that, um, and it's so much more interesting than what I'm about to say, but basically looks at the effect on all of these, um, on, on culture, basically, and people who produce culture. Uh, and the kind of devaluation and what's happening to our attention spans. And, and then on the other hand, he looks at large aggregations of data and how there's power there. So I felt like I got caught between these tectonic plates. Uh, there were two paths laid out before me. And one was, OK, you can, you can do more writing or uh, try to create more culture. Um, and I still love culture, and there, I think there's ways to do that. Uh, and I, I, I have a great admiration for, for, for that. Um, or I'd spent about 10 years researching this rare earth element of data that was you know, the best data if you want to make forward-looking predictions at the individual level. How, how do we scale this up? That's what got me into psychometric AI, which just to kind of frame that, I think is one part of something larger that you could call emotional AI or empathic AI. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how uh, I found it pinpoint predictive. Yeah, this is so cool that yeah. when, when you think of things like a, a long term, maybe like let's say just 15 year perspective on the tech explosion side yeah. of things. So you're here mm -hmm. in the Bay Area and you're, wa you're literally coming through this period of time now over the last 15 years and it is it's so crazy, like Jaron points out in his book as well, that this idea of data, what are we gonna be doing with this data? How is culture being shaped by this data? And then you, I like how you're starting to showcase to us here that it's a lot of this is about even empathic AI, mm -hmm. as you say, psychometric AI and empathic AI. Mm -hmm. And now explain to us more on, you know, you, you founding Pinpoint Predictive. Yeah, teach us more about this. Yeah, absolutely. So Pinpoint Predictive spun out of the Stanford Stardex Accelerator, which, which is uh, fantastic. And 
it was founded to be to bring to market the first privacy safe psychometric AI um, to disrupt people predictions. Uh, what we're here to do, and one way that I like to look at this, there, there's kind of how does this make our life better, um, but there's this kind of intellectual way that I like to think about it. Um, like our mission is to be an inflection point in the relationship between people and machines. Mm -hmm. And we've reached a point where there's a lot of data, um, cheap cloud computing and very powerful algorithms, and data's all around us, and we're entertained, and um, media, and e-commerce, and all of these different things, different platforms, different apps. But a lot of people have this sense that they're being followed around, or tracked, or, or stalked by technology. And that's true, and that's because behavioral targeting, um, the, the most data-driven ways are the most powerful and predominant by people who are serious about making people predictions today. And so the future is predicted based on narrow past behaviors to even the extent that future predictions are transparently about the past. You know, mm -hmm. Would you like to see this film? Well, kind of. It's the most similar one to what I just watched last night. Sure, but aren't there more interesting films I could be watching? Um, so our mission is to be that inflection point when between the past and the present where machines follow people and that point just starting right now already and going into the future where machines start to understand us as individuals mm -hmm. um, and be able to make forward-facing predictions. And I think that's incredibly exciting because it can make our lives better and I'd love to dive into that. And I also think it's exciting at, at a whole other level of meaning um, for kind of moral and political reasons that um, I'd, I'd be happy to, to, to dive into as well based on uh, kind of where things are in our country. Um, so that's, I mean, obviously we're a business we, and we do commercial work, but I, I think um, focusing on the individual is a special thing to do. Um, maybe it's a very American thing to do. Um, and I, I feel like if we did that a little bit more and celebrated individualism, uh, maybe we'd be in a better place than we are today. And maybe if our leaders did that a little bit more instead of trying to reduce individuality and put people into these buckets and groups, um, maybe we'd, we'd value our humanity a little bit more. Yeah, that's, that's, that's well said. There's a, there's this gorgeous uh, equilibrium, the Nash equilibrium, that mm -hmm. I, I feel is so where we're heading, but we definitely need to prop up the individual and the individual's beauty, their own sovereignty, their own ability to maximize their potential, while simultaneously realizing that the collective flourishing is, is important simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So like, knowing that equilibrium moving forward is, I think, you know, where we're heading, and I'm excited to see how we get there and how it ends up ends up actually prospering. Um, okay, to, as we get to you know, what, you, what these exciting ways of making things better are with, um, mm -hmm. with, I love how you just talked about this as an inflection point, because when you, when you speak about it in the way of an inflection point, it kind of gives us the, more of a, a realization that this, I like also how you called it an empathic AI, that for me to be able to understand how I can best synergize with machine intelligence mm -hmm. is super important moving mm -hmm. forward. And so, Talking about it in that sense is really beautiful. I like how you said that. So tell us about how exactly you guys, Pinpoint Predictive, help m help make things better. You were talking about also on the morality side of things, making things better. So yeah, teach us about that. Sure. Um, there are ways in which we're, we're doing this today um, that uh, we have particular applications. Um, and I, I, I'd be happy to go into them. Um, some of them are a little bit mundane. I think they're fascinating uh, when, when you get into the into some of the details, but um, to describe this at kind of a bigger level and talk about empathic AI, I'd like to start at that place because that's the level at which we can really answer the question, how can my life be better through technology? And let's start with the premise that you know, life is difficult. Um, we're in this um, 
simulation. Well, I, I think we, maybe we should uh, see what our different definitions are at some point, but um, I definitely feel comfortable with that word as a kind of um, biological reality, but um, we're, in, we're in this strange human condition, mm -hmm. and it's very hard for us to predict the future. Um, I don't know exactly what's going on in your head right now. Um, I can only imagine because it's full of brilliant ideas and you're exposed to <laughs> you. so, so much. And um, the weird human condition, as you said earlier, <laughs> the strangeness of being in this biological world that we find ourselves yeah. in. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the next sense that's going to come out of your mouth. I don't know the next one that's going to come out of my mouth. It's very hard to predict the future, and yet we feel like we're, we have this agency. Um, we feel like we're making decisions, and um, there's a lot of uh, things that don't come out in the way that we expect. I mean, uh, people have been having these thoughts for thousands of years about... Um, you know, life, life is hard, basic, basic idea. Now today we can talk about that in terms of, of prediction and data, but people have acknowledged this for a very long time. Why is life hard? Life is hard because we don't, because of that fundamental reason, uh, among many other reasons, right? But it's hard because um, we have to do certain things. We, we, we have, most people have to work. They have to choose what to study, what's the right career, what company should they work for? Um, who should they have a professional relationship with, a personal relationship? Um, what product should they buy? What experience will make them happy? Um, and people get it wrong over and over and over again. Um, so, uh, you know, and there's a lot of pain that comes out of that. And it's hard to admit that. Um, no, most people don't like to admit that, you know, they could have done something in a more optimal way that would have reduced their suffering and created more happiness. Now, it's very easy to think of relationships or, the, or little failures that we go through in life, but let me pull up something that's more interesting than that and more mundane at the same time. If, you know the well, you, you know all kinds of amazing fields and interesting fields. So, so positive psychology, mm -hmm. um, where psychology starts to use kind of scientific and quantitative methods to research the question of happiness, mm -hmm. what makes people happy. Well, it turns out that. The consensus was that buying things for ourselves doesn't really make us happier. Um, true, if, you, if I buy you a present, I'll, I'll get more happiness out of that. Um, or if I buy an experience, you go on a vacation, that tends to increase life satisfaction, which, which is a psychometric, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but buying things for yourself doesn't. So that's weird. Now, yeah. why does that happen? Yeah. Well. Uh, there wasn't a complete answer until recently uh, when someone who's a digital psychometrician um, named uh, in, in one of our, our, our colleagues on the academic side um, named Sandra Matz, she did research showing that when you control for personality and match the product someone's personality, that they'll spend more on this brand and they'll, that will actually measurably increase their life satisfaction. And what does this say? This says two things actually, very interesting things. Number one, we're so bad at making predictions that when we buy stuff for ourselves, we get it wrong just as much as we get it right. Uh, and, and you can kind of pull memories out of your head and, and fact check this with your own intuition. Mm -hmm. There are things you can remember that you felt happy with and things that kind of bummed you out because why did I spend money on this, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that's because it's hard for us to make predictions. There's, with, that, with the first one, I totally was feeling what you were saying with, man, giving gifts is happiness. When I go and get things for myself, not only are we stumped when thinking sometimes, looking through like the electronic tea kettle section on Amazon or on a store, we're just like, which one of these things do I even get? Mm -hmm. Which one of these do I want? Well, I, later I realized that I don't want the ones that have just a metal container. I want the one that has a glass container. I want to be able to see the water level more clearly. Mm -hmm. I want some cool LED lights on the bottom. Mm -hmm. These are just some interesting, strange things that you realize after maybe several cycles of purchasing like electronic tea kettles mm -hmm. for your teas and coffees and stuff. Don't even get me started on when you go and like there's... 50 different selections of jeans and like dress shirts and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So which ones do I want? Well, I like color. 
-hmm. I like color a lot and I like to stand out. So now is there a way to make things like pinpoint predictive be able to realize better, oh, Alan wants styles of electronics like this or styles of clothing like that and just make it so I don't have to go through this process of trying to figure shit out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, that's exactly what we do is uh, there are behavioral ways to figure things out. Um, like uh, Alan took a digital behavior and let's show him you know, an ad for that. Or, uh, and that's what happens today. And people feel followed around by the tea kettle. They feel followed around by the lawnmower um, after they already made a decision and are not going to buy another tea kettle for, for quite some time. Um, or there's the, the film example. It's forward looking, but it's so transparently and narrowly based on the past that it's not the most interesting film that you could be watching in that moment. Whereas a psychological recommender system works as well or better than the behavior one, but it says, Alan, um, we think you're going to like this because um, I'm, I'm speaking as if, as if I were in the consciousness of an, you know, uh, an artificial intelligence or machine learning, right? Yeah. Um, we've looked at billions and billions of data points and statistical patterns, and um, you're very similar in uh, numerous psychological dimensions to people who like the tea kettle that has the, the blue light and you can see the water, um, and maybe you should get to know this tea kettle sooner um, in, your, in your tea kettle adventure in life, yeah. and uh, you'll get more happiness sooner from that. That's right, yeah. Stuff like that, that's, yeah. okay, cool. Um, that, this is very important. Did you remember the second part? I completely forgot, but I'm sure some other it ideas will, will Some ideas will come. Arise, okay. Yeah. okay, okay. I just wanted to check in about that. Thanks, though. Um, <laughs> okay, and then I just, now let's keep playing on this point, because I think this point's super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, this idea that if we can sort of realize that there have been 100 billion humans before us mm -hmm. that built civilization, and they've all had exposure to these different stimuli in this biological reality that we live in. And then we can understand certain junctures that these 100 billion humans have went through in their life that depending on the things that they enjoy and depending on the junctures that they've been at, that then similar ideas like on um, a style of electronic that one may enjoy, et cetera, getting exposed to those things at an earlier point in their life adventure, in their life story is better. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, give us these examples, more on these examples on Pinpoint Predictive, because you put us in your shoes of your, um, your machine learning psychometric powered mm -hmm. system. Give us more um, thoughts on these examples and the relatability that they can have for bettering our lives. I think re reducing the suffering that happens when there's a mismatch, um, a difference in our expectation of what will make us happy compared with what actually does whether it's something as mundane as a tea kettle or something as significant as um, a relationship or a career um, or, or um, any of those important decisions that, that are hard to make. And going back to your other idea about all the people that came before, um, I'd like to borrow an idea from Yuval Harari. Yep. And in particular from a talk that he gave at Google a few years back. And he made a very provocative kind of statement that I think is one of the um, more interesting and uh, important things he said. He says a lot of interesting things, of course. Um, and a lot of people are interested in what he has to say. Um, and uh, and I, I had the privilege of getting to know his work uh, a little while, a little bit in, in the past and, and got to write a review in the, in the Washington Post of Sapiens. Um, and when I was doing that, I, I I was actually already doing pinpoint predictive. And so I watched this talk that he gave at Google. And he said something incredible, which is that in the development of humanity, there's been a shift in the locus of that authority, kind of ultimate authority. And it used to be, and of course, we don't really live in some kind of linear, uniform time. When I say used to be, it still is. Mm -hmm. Like all of these are still true, mm -hmm. um, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of things in life that are like that. Religion is one of them. Um, we have this idea as like a religion is this coherent thing, but a lot of things that people believe come from actually different things. Like um, 
a lot of people believe in ghosts, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people believe in good and evil. Um, and a lot of things get syncretized. And it's the same thing here with Yuval Harari's idea, and I'm actually going to get to hopefully, which is that, that, lo that transfer of locus. So the, the first one he mentions is religious authority, mm -hmm. um, where that's the highest authority. And of course, in many places in um, cultures, it still is. And then he says in, in cultures that went through the Enlightenment, that changed and there became more individualism and there's more human intuition, right? And, and let's, let's talk about mate choice because mate choice is something that I've written about a lot. Mate. Mate. Um, mate choice. Like who we choose to... Correct. Um, to breed with. Reproduce with. Reproduce with, yeah. With, yeah. Um, so, so mate choice is... I'm going to thread this into his argument as I, as I push it forward because it's fun to think about. It's, it's less abstract. So in very religious societies, mate choice is influenced by the religious view of the world um, and who's supposed to reproduce with whom and even who makes the, influences the decision and how much it has to do with certain groups or, you know, Casts or astrological signs, or all kinds of, um, you know, it's interesting. You could talk for hours about that. Um, but then when you go from religion to that sort of post enlightenment individualism, it, it's intuition um, and love marriage and only you know best. Interesting. And what can surpass your own intuition, yeah, your own yeah. self knowledge. Interesting. Interesting. Right? And that's, that's been dominant. And now, we're being challenged yeah, again. That's right. Right. Our, Data. Yeah. There's so much predictive, psychometric, AI-driven potential for for mate choice. Right. Whoa. Right. So so now our human narcissism is is being challenged, that's and right. I think maybe it was uh, I don't remember who said this. Um, I don't, I'm forgetting who said this, but they said that you know Darwin challenged our narcissism by comparing us with animals and, and, and Freud did it saying the ego is not quite the master of its own house and um, I don't know maybe I, I forgot uh, the, the ancient astronomer um, and Galileo the, Galileo yes. did it we were not the center of the universe um, maybe Freud was the person who brought this up and he was at the end of that um, mm. but anyway just, just another fun parallel history and science and the history of science has some patterns where it challenges us to confront our, our kind of our narcissism as human beings of, yeah. of our sense of control, yeah. our sense that we, we know so much. And um, the, the idea that the that, uh, ancient Greek philosopher, um, was it Socrates, mm -hmm. talking about, uh, I know a lot because I know what I don't know. No, yeah. Um, I mean, that's deep. That's deep with stuff, I, yeah. still something to think about. Um, it's huge. It's hugely huge. important. Hugely important. Our, knowing the extent of our own ignorance mm -hmm. is so a crucial. Right. And I, I feel really, really privileged to have um, gotten a lot of time to uh, dive into some fields, some particular areas, out to the edges of them. Mm -hmm. and when you go out to the edge of a field and you have to create new knowledge, it's very humbling yes. because you're, you're looking out over the edge and you say, I, I know this area really, really well, and oh, that's the end of the world for now. Um, something's gonna come up. It's not the end of history, but that's the end of knowledge right now. And, and that's humbling. And building a company is, is humbling. It's, it's, a, it's, uh, it's a team sport, and um, it, it's an extreme sport, and it's about collaboration. And um, so, I love thinking about these kind of ideas. So we, we, we are challenged, and this comes up a lot. There's a lot of anxiety that people have today about the relationship with technology. Um, I think people are, are kind of questioning their own free will a little bit, and, not, and people don't have, I don't wanna overgeneralize, that's a, that's a bad thing to do. But I think there's a lot of people that haven't thought maybe deeply enough about questions of agency or, yeah. or will. Yeah. Um, and they have kind of some, some fears about this um, that for, for me are, are interesting. Um, and, and, and so this, this comes up a lot, this kind of free-floating angst 
um, and it, you know, and, and social media and, and so on and so forth creates kind of um, a lot of questions. Um, so anyway, it's, it's very interesting to be right in the middle of that and to be a company that's founded first and foremost on privacy safety, of going above and beyond that for, for many reasons, um, and explaining the benefits of forward-facing predictions and, and what does privacy safety mean? Like, what Let's would get it, there. Let's get there in just a quick moment because yeah. ha- this point that you said about human narcissism is so interesting. Um, we've had this over and over again cycle back where our hubris is mm-hmm. so ends up being so visible. We're just overly excessively co- confident in our own in our own thinking that oh yeah the earth is the center of the universe or you know or oh here we go into the next era where psychometric powered ai knows out of 7.8 billion people well yeah these are the best candidates for you for potentially your mate mm-hmm. and that's crazy interesting and it's it's humbling because you don't necessarily have to spend all these bad mistakes like with the tea kettle or with the clothing option or whatever these mm-hmm. these these examples are mm-hmm. because if we remember when we were younger we had these fun little in in class in your school at times you would take these like who do you match with best in your in your school as like a as again one of these psychometric tests and it was you know kindergarten in comparison of an ai powered uh, psychometrics but it was very interesting, mm-hmm. nonetheless, to be able to see these things. So I just, I love your point about, about narcissism and also about agency was very interesting as well. How much agency, how often do we actually, how much agency do we have? How often do we look at ourselves in the mirror and aim to say, how much agency do I have? How much, how much should I um, give up to things that are better than the, hu- the strange human condition mm-hmm. that we have. So it's, it's very exciting stuff. So now, okay, now teach us about the, the privacy safe uh, side of the psychometric AI. Okay, um, well, thanks, Alan. I, I, I'd love to dive into that issue, and I promise you that I will. Okay, but go ahead. You just stimulated some, <laughs> some really <laughs> I, cool ideas in my head. Okay, and hit, up, hit us. I, I, I'd like to say something. Um, we're talking about narcissism. I hope, I hope it's not... Um, narcissistic but I'm a human being so I you know what what can you do like we we all have some some level of that I guess and uh, here's what I think so I have kind of a funny story and I could tell you the what the underlying logic is later on maybe at the end what I I think it is but it's a funny story because when I when I was an undergrad um, it was I remember like 2000 2001 and I had this roommate um, back in college and he had like a server farm in our room and he was sitting there, you know, um, I was like sleeping in kind of uh, doing the young people thing. And um, he was like doing business deals and the, the economy is booming and people were dropping out and IPOs and stuff. And I was uh, studying anthropology and learning, you know, um, writing about humor in an indigenous language. And I was like the last person in the world you'd expect to be sitting here talking about technology. Um, so it's an interesting story. And for me, I feel there's, there's a gap. There, there's a massive gap to cross. And um, here's, here's the narcissistic part, but I think it's interesting that, that maybe I could put some ideas together uh, that you know, span across areas like uh, evolutionary anthropology and uh, you know, I've, I've worked in a lot of developing countries and in, in political environments. I've worked with different, um, or I've, I've lived in Washington, D.C. for a while. And there's, there's a huge gap between Washington and Silicon Valley. There's a huge gap between Silicon Valley and the world. And uh, I, I love reading the media and seeing how people like to criticize Silicon Valley. And I feel like there's a lot of interesting motivations and some of it's very legitimate and some of it's completely on the other side of a, a disconnect. Um, but I guess... The point I'm, I'm trying to get to here is that technology is challenging us. And from, because of my background, um, because of the, the, the work I've done in, in behavioral biology um, that's similar to, um, in, in some regard to work of someone like Robert Sapolsky, although mm-hmm. he's obviously a, um, 
been doing this for a very long time and uh, more accomplished. But, but what's interesting is we, uh, we've come to some similar conclusions. And I, I think these technology is like a foil, if I'm using that in the right way. It's like, it's like this weird kind of mirror. Mm. Um, and I don't think it has to be a black mirror. I think that, that's, that show is really dark. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, but it's a mirror, and it, it reveals things about ourselves. Yes. And we, pro we, we project onto that mirror, and people feel anxious about this question of their agency. That's, that's what I wanted to get back to. Yeah. And that has nothing, nothing to do with technology, and it does at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, how's that possible? Well, people have been worrying about their agency you know, since there's records of people thinking. Mm -hmm. um, that, like, this is an ancient question, mm -hmm. and in civilizations, <laughs> you know, um, in different parts uh, of the world, like people have been, it, it's, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem in, in religion. I mean, uh, in, 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 in every successful large religion, it's a problem. Um, I mean, that's, that's, uh, you could pull up an idea like karma, for example. Um, if something good happens to me or bad happens to me, is that because of my good intention now or my bad intention now, or is it because of something that happened in the past that, that happened was good or bad? It, it's, like, it's like psychologically indeterminate. Um, and it, 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 there's, there's, people have been struggling with this in the East, in the West, uh, and technology is challenging us in new ways and making a lot of people have some anxiety about this question of agency that's um, an old question. Yeah. Um, it's as old as our biology, and I think it's, it's really, really interesting. And when you think about it more deeply, um, some interesting things happen. It doesn't, uh, th there's, can be kind of more freedom, more, more liberation. Um, yeah, that's uh, right. So I love diving deep into these uh, challenging areas yeah. and figuring out how can Silicon Valley kind of get a better perspective on itself and do something good in the world yeah. rather than just um, coming up with crazy ideas and not thinking about the consequences of, of what that means. Amen, that's right. And technology challenging agency is a fascinating three word phrase. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do privacy safe. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Privacy safe, psychometric AI, let's talk about that. Can sure. predictive. Yeah, so, so the idea of um, modeling people's psychology, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful thing to be able to do, um, and it requires some powerful safeguards. So we were founded um, around patent pending technology um, that allows us to be more privacy safe than a, a lot of the other um, kind of tech platforms out there today. And, and to, to make this very simple, um, in some respect, we don't have any personally identifiable real names or contact information. We don't allow that to go into our environment at all. Um, and that's one important area um, that, that makes it privacy safe. And also, we use psychology to make predictions for approved business use cases. Um, we, we don't, we're not like a data provider that, uh, sells data on people, we don't do that. We use, we, we build models um, to understand the reasons why people engage and then make complex optimizations um, that protect people's um, data but get to a business result that's positive to make people's lives better. So there's, there's, um, there's something there that I thought was really interesting that that you that separate that separates you both that there's this 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 strong not non no personal identifiers side of things and then the other thing is the is the business cases these business decisions that you guys get to make um with the incoming requests mm -hmm. is that you guys get to pick what you want to um to say yes to mm -hmm. so that it's not um simply whoever comes gets to work with you. That's correct. It's very important. Yeah. 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 So, so again, just to, to recap, one is not having any, any personally identifiable information. So we won't even touch social media data at all because it's connected to people's names and um, it, it's kind of a, uh, been a problematic area 
recently. Um, you know, we can um, still, you know, leverage that media um, and do interesting things with that. And then the other thing is, we because we, we're not like a, a data provider, we won't say, oh, here's a group of, um, you know, here's a group of depressed teenagers on Facebook and sell that to everybody and just wait till something terrible happens, right? It's a horrible um, recipe that, that's for not disaster. A good thing to do. Yeah. Um, but if, say, uh, an important, you know, if the, if the um, National Institutes of Health wants to help people, and it's a you know good group, reputable, then yes. we look at an objective, which is how can you help people? Because the, the objective shouldn't be, um, I'd like to buy this kind of data, because there's a privacy problem, and there's also an efficiency problem. So our technology, if they were to come and say, you know, we could measure exactly how much more, um, you know, of, of X, Y, you know, Z traits people are, and, and many other things that people don't even think of. So the fun thing about uh, social scientific data science is there's always like these three levels of, of findings. There's the obvious stuff. Um, there is the stuff that's not obvious, but it makes sense and it answers questions. And then there's the curly fries category. What's the curly The curly fries, fries category is like the kind of WTF category. It's <laughs> um, curly fries in the early research in this field was found uh, to correlate with high IQ. Interesting. Um, and it wasn't like a spurious, weird um, artifact of just a few people liking curly fries. You know, all that stuff was controlled for. I don't know if anyone has a hypothesis of what curly fries. Um, you know, it's easier to explain why people like Mozart. It, you know, whether you know that's just what the data science says, um, or science, or um, the sound of Morgan Freeman's voice mm -hmm. is sure. correlates with high IQ. It maybe people who watch a lot of documentaries, and that's correlated with Morgan Freeman narrating them. Sure. Um, like to consume more knowledge. Yes. Uh, that's what social science, data science looks like. Yes. Um, and we're in a fun area because we look at the individual. Um, yes. Whereas yes. social science today has a lot of ideological biases where they only look at a couple of groups and averages, and that's a problem. It's, it's, a, it's a huge, huge ideological problem because business today needs to make predictions about people. And we need predictions that are going to help us, that are individualized to us. But social science needs to go further. Um, it can't just focus on, you know, all men versus all women or um, average. Like, like behavioral economics is a fascinating field. Uh, but I have to criticize it a little bit because it's great to know that on average we have these irrationalities. Although from an evolutionary point of view, they've become a little bit less irrational. But anyway. But how do you operationalize that? Like, what is person A's, you know, level? Like, what is the variance in the irrationality? Mm -hmm. And there are different people. And how do you build models yeah. to make real predictions and have real business results? That's where that field needs to go. That's right, yeah. Yeah, this, the social sciences of the individual and the psychometric profiles of those individuals is very fascinating in the way that they engage in their in these this biological environment mm -hmm. that we play in mm -hmm. um, and being at this field I like I like your point earlier about being at the edge when you're at the edge of knowledge there's a lot of hubris there's a lot of hubris and that you've got to be very careful you have to be humble you have to be humble just in case well, I, I, think, I think I think being at the edge is, is, the, is a cure for hubris it's a uh, cure for hubris, uh, yeah. totally. Yeah. But being humble mm -hmm. at the same time, sometimes um, it's, it's, we can get overly confident in our echo chambers of edge. And there's a lot of issues that can happen with disseminating the knowledge to the youth that are coming up that we need to get better at in education, etc. Okay, two questions on the way out. Avi, first question is, what is a core driving principle of your life? Well, in two parts, I mean, one kind of used to, has been, one has been, I'm the kind of person that really likes complex systems. Uh, you know, it's funny, my, my, my mom was telling me about when I was a kid and what my favorite toy was. Um, 
and I'm glad she brought it back because it brought back these fond memories that were hidden inside of my head I'd forgotten but um, they were like these Japanese boxes um, think like the Russian dolls but way cooler mm. um, different colors different shapes there's like one inside of another inside of another I've always loved iterations um, you know I, I've loved depend I've loved like clauses inside of clauses in language I, I like that you know if, if you're if you're building something um, and I like understanding how very complex systems fit together and being able to see the whole better and faster and getting there getting there sooner so there is no perfect person in the world to write a, a science book about heritable psychometric traits I mean it, had, it covered too much ground um, but I felt like I was as good as person as any to give it a try um, and when I understood that more powerful, forward-facing, privacy-safe, um, interpretable, and efficient people predictions were possible, there could be a scientific standard in people data to compare people on something meaningful and predictive, um, and that, that could be done. I wanted to get there first. So that's the first part of the answer. But the, the second part is actually implementing it. I've, you know, I had to. Um, it, it's much more of a, a team sport, so that's changed my perspective a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, collaboration is an interesting thing. It's it's. Um, I think that pushes people to grow and um, to get people with such different expertise to work together yeah. on on a on something very complex yeah. and and to kind of give a back and forth to different expertise is, is um, a beautiful thing and it's, and it's a difficult thing yes. and it's something that's necessary for progress. Yeah. <laughs> Avi, this has been such a fun show. I really appreciate you coming on and teaching us about Pinpoint Predictive, Psychometric AI. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This has been a blast. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on what we were talking about. Let us know, get that community rolling. Also check out the links below to Pinpoint Predictive. Go and check them out. And much love. Support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Support them, help them grow. Also build the future, everyone. Shout out to Ron for producing and directing the show. We love you all so much and we will see you soon. Peace.